We are very happy to have everyone here. We're about ready to start the program. We just added another language, so we had to wait just a little bit to get things set up. But it's a very special day. And we pray that God will lead us as we go. Let's just pray before we begin. Our gracious Lord, thank you for your loving kindness. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the privilege we have of coming to you in times of grief, of disappointment. But our confidence is strong. We know that you will guide and bless and lead. Thank you for the messages that have been prepared. They are so relevant, so important. And we pray, Lord, that you'll be with all those who are helping the program work in a technical way. But we pray that you'll be with each of us, that our hearts will be open, that your Holy Spirit will speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. And it, we will pray that everything will go well. Make sure you sign in to the language that you are translating. Uh, and you may listen in another one, but make sure you are speaking in the language of your assignment. God bless. It is no understatement to say that our world is hurting from the pandemic that began over a year ago. While the economic impact has been great, our focus today is not about financial difficulties experienced by many. We want to spend a few moments talking about our relationships with one another and especially those whom we have loved deeply. We have invited Dr. Ann Hamill, a much respected psychologist who has faced her own personal traumas, to be our guest speaker for this webinar. Dr. Hamill received her PhD in counseling psychology from Andrews University and a Doctor of Ministry degree in formational counseling from Ashland Theological Seminary. One of her responsibilities is caring for and providing support for missionaries, especially during times of crisis. I believe you will understand why we have invited her to speak about finding joy in suffering, grieving for a loved one. This past year has been a challenging and difficult year unprecedented in so many ways. When the World Health Organization identified COVID-19 as a pandemic on March 11 last year, most of us had no idea how our lives would be impacted. My husband and nine members of our family are in health care. On March 14, we met together to talk about how we, as a family, might be impacted by the pandemic and what steps we would take to keep safe and to keep those around us safe. We recognized that this would likely be our last in-person gathering as a family until the pandemic was over. We also recognized that healthcare workers across our nation would soon be engaged in a battle to save lives against an invisible enemy. So little was known about the virus at that time but it was frightening to see what was happening in China and in Italy. At one point, my husband said that if the virus spread here, the way it had in Wuhan or in Italy, that we could very likely lose a family member. 12 months after the pandemic began, more than 2.6 million people have died from the virus, more than a half million here in the United States, and the virus is continuing to spread and the number of people dying continues to increase. These 2.6 million people belong to families. They are missed and grieved by loved ones, by a husband or a wife, by children and grandchildren. They are someone's brother, 
someone's sister. These 2.6 million people belong to communities. They have friends and neighbors who also are grieving their loss. We have all been impacted by the loss of lives as a result of this pandemic. We can't listen to the news without hearing how many people have been infected and how many people have died. The death toll related to COVID-19 brings to the forefront of our awareness the sad reality that death is a part of our lives here on this earth. Our family confronted this reality last April when my brother-in-law developed a fever just three weeks after the pandemic began. Following guidelines, he self-isolated and began working from home. Four days later, his symptoms were serious enough that he was admitted to the hospital. Three days later, on Easter Sunday, he was transferred to the intensive care unit. Two days after that, he was put on a ventilator. Approximately 20% of people with COVID develop symptoms serious enough that they need to be hospitalized. And about 5% of those are serious enough that they need to be in intensive care units. Putting a patient on a ventilator is considered a last resort measure to save a patient's life. In those early days of the pandemic here in the US, 80 to 85% of patients who were put on ventilators died. Like 2.6 million other families this past year, our family was facing a crisis. Each night, our family met on Zoom to get updates on my brother-in-law's condition and to pray. No one could visit him, not his wife, not his children, not even my husband. Day by day, we got the update that his condition was getting worse. My husband was working tirelessly to do everything he could to save his brother's life. But after eight days on a ventilator, his organs were failing. His body was shutting down. With a heart rate of only 18, we feared that death was near. I could see the sadness on my husband's face when he came from home from the hospital late that evening. He whispered to me as we went to bed that night. I wrote Lowell's death announcement before I left the hospital. I was afraid I wouldn't be able to do it after it happened. Grieving the death of a loved one is a painful process. My husband and his brother are identical twins. We live next door to each other. We have Sabbath lunches together each week. My husband and his brother have practiced medicine together for years, and now they run a health system together. They are and have always been a team in every sense of the word. The thought of my brother-in-law's death brought a deep sense of loss and sadness to my heart. I could only imagine how my husband was feeling or how his wife and children were feeling. His death would leave a huge hole in our family. Grieving the death of a loved one symbolizes the value of that individual in the lives of those who grieve. It symbolizes the place they hold in our hearts and in our, our lives. The pain and suffering that we experience when we grieve reflects the strength of the bond between us. It hurts when death takes our loved ones from us, and the pain we experience can penetrate the very core of our being. Our family was fortunate and blessed that my brother-in-law survived. During the night, he made a miraculous turnaround. The next morning, for the first time since he entered the hospital, his test results and his vitals showed signs of improvement. As a family, we are deeply grateful and very fortunate that my brother-in-law was among the very small percentage of patients that survived after being on a ventilator. But many others have not been so fortunate not only have more than 2.6 million people died from COVID this past year, close to 57 million people have died from other causes, heart disease and cancer being the leading causes of death worldwide. 
50% of deaths from all causes are among those 70 years of age and older. As we face the loss of so many lives as a result of this pandemic, I think it's helpful for us to remember that before the early 1800s, 50% of all deaths occurred during infancy and childhood, resulting in an average life expectancy of only 30 years. Prior to our understanding of how to prevent and treat infectious diseases, only 10% of the global population reached the age of 60. Historians tell us that prior to the scientific era, human beings lived with the constant presence of death. That the limits of human life were actually defined by infectious diseases. Diseases like the plague, measles, smallpox, tuberculosis, polio, and others. This year has been hard for all of us because COVID-19 is a new killer, an infectious disease that has crept into our lives and to use the language of scripture in John 10:10, 10, 10, like a thief who has come only to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Not only have we lost loved ones to death, we have been robbed of the privilege of visiting the sick and the elderly, robbed of time with grandparents and grandchildren, denied the privilege of sharing meals with friends or visiting neighbors. COVID is still a mysterious disease in many ways. When exposed, some people are infected while others are not. The disease is fatal to some while others experience only mild symptoms or no symptoms at all. The infection and death rate around the world has not been evenly distributed. Some countries have been much harder hit than others. North and South America and Europe have been the hardest hit. Age and gender are also factors. 95% of COVID-19 deaths have occurred among those 50 years of age and older, with 88% being among those 60 years of age and older. Women live longer than men in every country in the world, but men have been 50% more likely to die of COVID than women have. Prior to COVID, many of us had come to believe that infectious diseases had been conquered. Diseases that take the lives of children and used to wipe out large segments of the population. Then COVID entered our world unexpectedly, like a thief and caught us off guard. It has set off alarms in each of our hearts that are telling us that we are not safe. COVID has brought each of us to an awareness of just how fragile life is and how vulnerable we are. Torben Berglund took his medical training from Copenhagen University. As both a psychiatrist and a psychotherapist, he has taken special interest in working with patients with depression, anxiety, personality disorders, as well as integrating relational, religious, and existential perspectives in psychotherapy. He is one of the associate directors of Health Ministries Department here at the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Torben, the pandemic has impacted everyone differently, and yet it has created a unique global common bond. Everyone has been touched by it. How has this changed our understanding of suffering? Well, um, it remains to be seen how we have changed. I think that's something we'll still have to see and how this will impact us in the years to come. Uh, but I think for sure uh, there's been suffering on a level that we seldom have seen, at least not in recent history. And that has been so universal uh, that everyone basically have suffered and that we all have lost something in one way or another. And if in no other way, then at least our way of life 
like around the world, almost everyone has been impacted uh, by this pandemic and it mm. has disrupted our, our yeah. lives. And uh, for some people, there have been major problems, major losses uh, for maybe the majority. It's been more minor problems in a way and minor losses, but I still think everyone has felt this greater vulnerability sensitivity the sense of being more fragile than we maybe otherwise would feel so i think in this sense suffering during this pandemic it has not been just limited to the unfortunate few which maybe in our daily life our daily world then it's sort of the few a few people who who sort of we see as suffering but basically all of us have 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 experienced it to some way or another um, and I think what it has impacted is our sense of ourselves, maybe our sense of invincibility, our sense of being strong. It has been shattered because we've all found ourselves, we've been at risk of illness, of death, of loss, and many have actually experienced these, these things. Um, interesting, in, in the UK, United Kingdom, there was done a study early on in the pandemic that showed that people actually were more worried about the social and mental impact of the pandemic than they actually were of getting sick from COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So that, that just indicates like on how many levels uh, it has, has impacted us. Um, and sometimes I talk about this, that this is not just a, like, it, we're not just talking about a physical illness. Uh, but this pandemic, uh, it has truly been what we can call a bio, psycho, social and spiritual crisis and pandemic. It's truly been an existential crisis for, for the world and on the individual level, uh, also truly a crisis for most people. And in this, I think it's important to recognize that even though we've all been in the same pandemic, in a way, how we respond is different and unique. Each individual, what it means to each individual, how it's impacted each individual, that may be unique. Uh, and it's important that we, we understand that and allow for that and allow ourselves also to react differently than my family member uh, or my colleague or someone else because the meaning of it uh, is unique to, to each individual. So what I hope that we will learn from this pandemic as we, at one point sooner or later, hopefully emerge from it, uh, that at least we have learned to be more real, more realistic about ourselves, about life and the world we live in, and that we can understand one another be more empathetic, be more supportive and more kind to one another uh, as we move into the future. Wow, <laughs> so much to think about and uh, I appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Bergler, I do have a question though. You've, you've talked with many people who have experienced uh, loss, uh, some significant loss, and it's impacted them uh, not just emotionally, but also spiritually. H how? I mean, how is that going to impact them? Or how can they relate to that, I guess? Yeah, I think that, that we have to acknowledge that grief and accept and appreciate that grief, it is a normal and healthy response to, to loss. Uh, strength is not not to grieve. Uh, when we experience the kind of losses that people have experienced. Um, and with that, with loss, there comes sadness. There can be also other kinds of emotions like fear, like anger over what was lost. And at the same time, which may to some seem a bit paradoxical, but like they can also be positive emotions as one appreciates, remembers the good things uh, that, that one experienced. Um, and in this process of dealing with loss, grieving, again, we have to understand that how it is experienced, the intensity, the process and the duration of grief 
also is very individual and varies from person to person. Uh, and this can be a challenge also sometimes in relationships um, or family context or wherever that is, where sort of one has in a way experienced the same loss, uh, but the process one goes through differs significantly. Uh, I think I think a good metaphor for grief uh, is like waves on an ocean. Uh, at times it can be a full storm, a raging storm. Uh, other times it can be a gentle breeze. Uh, and that's how the process of grief often is. And it comes and goes like the weather on an ocean comes and goes, it differs. Uh, that, that's how it often is in grief also. And then it can be a challenge sometimes if one goes through this, the same loss, uh, but one is at different places in, in, in the process. But I think it's important to accept and acknowledge is that the grief process cannot be controlled. I think it's not, grief is not sort of an orderly process where you go through one stage after the other until you emerge and then you're done and over with it. That's not how grief works, but maybe used to think so, uh, mm. but we sort of abandon that, that, that kind of thinking. Grief, the emotions, they come and go, and these different aspects of grief, uh, they may differ, come at different times. Um, what I think that grief really should be, uh, and we should allow it to be that, and we should give people space to that, is that grief really can be a time out in life where one reflects on what was, what is, and what is to come. And that you don't run through or rush through or escape any of these things. You need to spend appropriate time both reflecting on what was, what is, and what what, what is to come. Um, and in that sense, what also many people experience is a spiritual crisis. Uh, in, in times of grief, in times of loss. Um, and I think uh, for me, one of the great books resources uh, on, on grief is C.S. Lewis, uh, who wrote the book, A Grief Observed, after he lost his wife. Um, right. And if I, if I may, just I think he, he, he shares so well this spiritual aspect uh, of uh, his own crisis in, in that, and in the beginning of the book, he said, like, meanwhile, where is God? This is one of the most disquieting symptoms. And he says, like, go to him. Like, this is still C.S. Lewis talking. Go to him when your need is desperate, when all help is vain, and what do you find? And his experience, a door slammed in your face. A sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. After that, silence. You may as well turn away. The longer you wait, the more emphatic the silence becomes. There are no lights in the windows. It might be an empty house. Was it ever inhabited? It seemed so once. And that seeming was as strong as this. What can this mean? Why is he so present a commander in our time of prosperity and so very absent? a help in time of trouble. This is like C.S. Lewis, the champion of faith, uh, who for himself, when he went through the grief, the loss of his wife, had these deep questions and experiences of where God was not as close and as present as, as, as he wanted. And he said there also, uh, about himself that not that I am, I think, in much danger of ceasing to believe in God. The real danger is of coming to believe such dreadful things about him. The conclusion I dread is not so there is no God after all, but so this is what God really is like. Deceive yourself no longer. Uh, he fears that he will come to see God as not this present, compassionate, uh, rock to lean on in times of, of trouble, that God will be absent. And I think 
this this journey that C.S. Lewis was on, the very honest journey where he like wrote these things down, he expressed it, he talked with God, he raged about these things um, also, uh, but he allowed himself to go through the process. He found a resolution eventually. And I think that is the challenge to all of us uh, also, that we have to allow ourselves to go through the emotions, go through the thoughts, um, not give up in the midst uh, of, of this, but just keep keep going. Uh, and then in the end, that we can find the resolution, we can find our way forward in life, as well as in our relationship with God. Yeah, you, you mentioned several points there that were so important, at least uh, for me. It was helpful for me to see taking time out uh, for, for the grief and allowing that to take place. I also found it very helpful to hear uh, talk about the storm and how way, I mean, I, I, I visualize waves coming, uh, some more intense than others, not always steady, but coming surges, ups and downs. And I uh, appreciate that, uh, that insight. Um, as we think about suffering, uh, there's this idea of suffering and joy. They seem almost like opposites. Uh, and, and yet somehow some are able to manage to find hope whether we call it hope or joy, we begin to find that in the midst of the situation, there can be both hope and joy, even during this difficult time. I, is that possible? How, how is it possible? Well, I, I think it's very possible because that's how our minds work, that, that uh, emotions, feelings, states of minds are not mutually exclusive. Um, and, and you can have these feelings at the same same time. That's very possible. And especially in grief, that is possible. Sometimes uh, we sort of equate the experience of grief with depression. And there are many similarities. Many of the symptoms are, are similar. But whereas depression typically becomes like a cloud that covers everything, there is no light breaking through at any time. In grief, it's different because we're still able to experience mm. positive emotions also in the midst of grief. And that's okay. Sometimes people struggle with that. They may even feel bad conscience because they can feel joy, they can feel or they can laugh uh, or have these other positive experiences, emotional experiences. And that's perfectly okay. Uh, it doesn't mean that you are uh, sort of grieving any less uh, or that you're not taking seriously the loss that you have experienced. We shouldn't feel guilty. You're saying we shouldn't feel guilty if we're having joy and, and hope and sadness combined. No. Um, and like it, it's, it's important like to allow oneself that. It's okay. It's an indication of healthy grief. Uh, if you don't feel any sadness, if you don't feel any loss, if there's no negative emotions, that's probably not a healthy indication. If you don't feel any positive emotions at any time, that may be an indication that you maybe are experiencing, you develop more of a depression uh, and may need help for, for that, that, that also. But it's like allowing ourselves space for both. I think that's, that's important. And I think that's it's possible when you're able to keep perspective on, on life, realizing that even though you've suffered loss and you may have suffered major loss, uh, then still that doesn't mean that everything is lost. Uh, hopefully, in throughout the process, uh, you are able to appreciate the things that are not lost also and appreciate the good things that you actually had uh, also that 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 are those are good good things it's good indications it's, it's healthy functioning to 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 do that uh, but again not ex expect things to be just steady that you won't be that you will feel sadness and joy at the same time these things come and go and as we said it comes it becomes as waves all often uh, that in the midst of the storm there may be huge crushing waves of sorrow of grief 
that you may be experiencing, but maybe once in a while you spot the sun and the rays of sun breaking through the clouds, even in the midst of the storm. That's how I think grief can be and a healthy grief uh, can manifest itself that way. Wow. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Harbin. We appreciate uh, your sharing and uh, a lot to think about here. A lot of, uh, I found a lot of encouragement here and uh, some anticipated uh, mixed emotions. So thank you so much for sharing. Really, really appreciate it. God bless. The scriptures make it clear that hardship and suffering are a part of the world that you and I live in. In Romans 8:21, the Apostle Paul talks about our world being under the bondage of corruption. In verse 22, he says, For we know that the whole creation has been moaning together as in the pains of childbirth. This past year, our world has been moaning and suffering as a result of this pandemic. But the truth is that every child that enters our world is born into a hurting and broken world, a world where nothing functions as God intended. Most parents do their best to protect their children from the pain and suffering of life, but no home is perfect and no parent is perfect. In fact, many people are actually born into families where the pain and suffering of life begins in the home. I grew up in a family where there was a lot of conflict and tension between my parents. The dysfunction in my home led me to seek out a relationship with God, a relationship that would provide me with the internal stability and the support that my parents didn't seem able to provide. I came to experience God as a loving, caring, and protective Heavenly Father. I believed that He both heard and answered my prayers. As a young person, I had a desire to serve God with my life. While still in college, I met a young man who had the same commitment to God that I had and the same desire to serve Him that I did. We got married and we were able to create a home where Christ was the center, a home that was free of conflict. Shortly after we were married, we received a call to serve as missionaries in Africa. My husband and I considered it a privilege to be able to serve as missionaries. We had no idea what challenges we might face or what sacrifices we might be asked to make, but we believed God was calling us. We believed He would take care of us and provide for our needs. We spent our first three years in Bujumbura, Burundi. The first year was hard for me, as it is for most new missionaries. There was so much to learn and so much to get used to. But after the first year, I learned to love Burundi and its people. In many ways, my adult life was shaped by my experience as a young missionary wife in Burundi. Our first son was born during our time there. During our time in Burundi, I came to see the challenges and hardships in relative terms. I'll give you an example. There were months when the water in our home would go off every morning at 5 a.m. and wouldn't come back on until after 10 p.m. Every night I would have to fill the bathtub so that I would have water to cook with and clean with the following day. Initially, I experienced this as a hardship until I took stock of the fact that most of the women living around me carried the water they needed to cook and to clean with in jerry cans or buckets on their heads, often for long distances. At least I had a bathtub that I could fill and I had a faucet in my home that I simply needed to turn on. Looking at the situation differently transformed the hardship that I was experiencing into a blessing. How we think about the challenges we face in life makes a tremendous difference in how we handle them. 
After living in Burundi for three years, we moved to Rwanda when our oldest son was not quite a year old. Our second and third sons were born during our time there. We loved our lives in Rwanda. It was one of the happiest times in my life. Ellen White talks about a Christian home being a foretaste of heaven here on earth. That was my experience. I had a wonderful husband and three adorable little boys. We believed that we were where God wanted us to be and that we were doing what He wanted us to do. I didn't really experience the hardships of living in Rwanda as true hardships. Most of the hardships that we experienced were things that were a part of the common experience of the people who lived there. There were so many things that we loved about living in Africa. When our boys were three, six, and eight years old, my husband and I decided to make a trip to visit Victoria Falls. We would have to travel by road through Tanzania, Zambia, and into Zimbabwe in order to get there. Travel in Africa can be challenging, especially with three young children. But we'd lived in Africa for 11 years by that time, so we felt comfortable that we would be able to handle whatever challenges we might face on the trip. And we prayed about the trip, and we believed that we had both God's permission and His blessing to do the trip. We trusted Him to be with us and to take care of us. We had a wonderful trip. Yes, there were challenges. Flat tires and car trouble are a part of the common experience of travel in Africa. But as I said earlier, challenges are always a matter of perspective. We were all safe, we were all healthy, and we were together as a family. That was what was most important. On the last day of the trip, we stopped for a picnic lunch at noon, and we could see the mountains of Rwanda in the distance. It had been a long trip, so we were looking forward to getting home. I remember specifically thanking God for our safe and enjoyable trip and for His presence with us on the trip. Just before sunset on that Friday evening, we crossed the Rwanda-Tanzania border. We planned to spend the night in a nearby hotel where we would spend the Sabbath before continuing our journey back to our home the following day. My next memory is awakening in a hospital bed in Belgium, not knowing where I was or how I'd gotten there. I learned that our family had a head-on collision with a truck and that my husband had already been buried in Rwanda. My three-year-old son was four floors above me in the pediatrics unit. His skull was fractured, his leg was crushed, and two toes were missing. My six-year-old and eight-year-old sons were still in Rwanda. They had been the only two family members at their father's funeral. As the reality of what had happened really sank in, I felt overwhelmed by grief. I didn't know how I would face life without my husband. How would I raise three boys on my own? How would I support them? Where would we live? In many ways, the hardest question for me to answer was, where was God? All of my life, I had known and experienced Him as a loving Heavenly Father. I had always trusted Him to protect me from harm and to provide for my needs. In my mind, I imagined Him turning from me as our family rounded that corner on a narrow, winding road in Rwanda on that Friday evening. I felt abandoned by God. The two weeks that I spent in a hospital in Belgium were the two most difficult weeks of my life. This past year, as so many have lost loved ones, some of you may be wondering where God is in all of this. I know from my own personal experience that sometimes our loss can be so great and the pain that we are experiencing can be so overwhelming that it can block our view of God, making it hard for us to see Him with us. 
Yet in spite of the fallen and broken world that you and I live in, God is with us. He has chosen to make his dwelling among his people, to actually live within you and me, even in our suffering. Audrey Anderson trained for ministry at Newbold College in England. After working as a legal editor in London and later running her own communications company in Sweden, she served as a pastor, executive secretary, and a number of departmental roles in Sweden. Today, she is the executive secretary of the Trans-European Division. Audrey's husband was killed in a tragic accident a few years ago. But also recently, she lost her father to a non-COVID-related illness. So Audrey, I have a question for you. You know, this has been a difficult year for all of us, but how has your loss created difficulties for you? Uh, what kind of impact has this experience of losing your loved ones, has, how has that been on you? Well, based in St. Albans, just outside London, we have been on lockdown at the time of recording for 393 days. And lockdown has varied. When we began, it was we could go out one hour a day to exercise and that was it. And no one expected it to last this long. We were told maybe a month, six weeks, two months, and that would be it. COVID would be a thing of the past. And so initially, lockdown and COVID didn't impact. But having spent, normally, I spend 150 days a year traveling. And so suddenly, to be grounded, to be home and to be alone was a new experience. And it made me realize again, the fact that I was alone. And this is something that I've discovered as you experience loss, you don't just experience it once, you experience it again and again in different situations. And so for me, it was to stop, to reflect, to acknowledge the loneliness and the aloneness and then see what did I do. So for me, I used the tools that I had learned when my husband had died. And I also began to look for blessings. And so on my walks, I would look for the signs of spring. I would look for the flowers. I would look for the small things and I would practice gratitude. As you said in your introduction, my dad died on the 29th of December last year. And in August last year, um, he fractured his spine and was paralyzed. Mm. We brought him home in September. And for me, COVID was a blessing. Normally I would be traveling and I was able to move home, be with my parents, work and help support and look after my father. And so for me, it has been a time of relearning lessons, relearning the importance of stopping, acknowledging how I feel, recognizing it, giving it to God, recognizing the presence of God and looking for the blessings. And you know, even in situations of loss, there are blessings. And for me, the greatest blessing was, or is, the presence of God. God is here and God never ever fails. Those are such precious words. Um, you've obviously been working on processing your grief over a period of time now. Um, are there specific steps that you have taken to move beyond uh, this, the pain of loss and to find healing? You've, you've mentioned some of those. What would you say are some of the steps that you've taken to help uh, alleviate some of the pain of loss? 
Well, Larry, I wouldn't actually say that you ever move beyond loss. I would say you move forward with it. You know, everyone experiences grief differently. And my experience is unique to me. But yet there are, there are some commonalities. And when you experience grief, or for me, it was when my husband died, when my father died, it's like someone has taken time and they've ripped it up. They've created a gap and, you know, it's now four and a half years since Lars was killed in an accident. And that gap between the time that we shared together and now is getting larger and larger every day. And so he left something that can never be replaced. No one else can ever come in and fill. Other people can come around and I learned to move forward with the blessings and the experiences that we enjoy together. And they have made me who I am. And then I move forward, but I have to move forward without him. Mm. I have to move forward without my dad. Mm. So for me, the steps were one, to actually acknowledge the loss and to recognize that this is a new reality, to acknowledge that things have changed. They will never ever go back to what they were, but that change gives me an opportunity to grow. That I recognize there will be good days and there will be bad days. You know, when, like, when we talked to earlier, I said, when um, you experience loss, you process it time and time again in different ways. Grief comes at the time when you least expe expect it. You know, a gesture from someone, a word, a smell, all of those things can trigger a memory. And all of a sudden you can feel happy at that memory and sad. And it is just to accept that this is something that you are going to move forward with for the rest of your life. It also is something I've learned, which I found extremely difficult, is asking other people for help. I was in Cyprus on a business trip when my husband died and I had to travel back to Sweden. And when I was on the last leg of my journey, I was in an airport lounge and I was very upset. And one of the um, assistants in the lounge asked me what, what she knew me, because I'd been in there often. And I told her my husband had just been killed. And she stayed with me and she walked with me to the gate. And at, as she left, she said, let me give you a piece of advice. Ask for help. People will not know what to do. Um, and they will want to help, but they don't know how. So don't be afraid. Ask for help. And I found that by asking people for help, I have opened doors to be able to build new relationships, to give people an opportunity to minister to me and also for me to minister to them. And so asking for help is for me a very important and something sometimes something that we don't do. Then also recognizing the presence of God and the goodness of God. You know, bad things happen, but the bad things don't come from God. We live in a sinful world and sin brings grief, loss, death. But God is always there and God is still good. And so I come back to what I mentioned last, learning to express gratitude, learning to look for that goodness and learning to recognize it and to share it with others, to tell others about the goodness of God. Because I can honestly say that although I would not choose to live without my husband, 
The last four and a half years have been years of blessing. Years when I have got to know God in ways that I would never ever have got to know him. So although something bad happened, something good has come out of it. Audrey, what a, what a testimony, but also what important insights and thoughts for all of us to consider. Um, you've been through a lot, you've grown a lot. Uh, may God continue to be with you. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. As Adventists, we believe that before the return of Jesus, there will be a time of trouble in which the people of God will be cut off from all earthly support. This past year, as governments around the world closed their borders and issued lockdowns and stay-at-home orders, many people have turned their attention to the return of Jesus. Many have asked if they are prepared to face a time of trouble. The time that I spent in the hospital in Belgium was the most difficult time in my life. It was, for me, my own personal time of trouble. I wanted to believe that God was with me, but what had happened seemed to scream that either God was not there, or if He was, He didn't care. Many people who experience trauma or loss feel forsaken or abandoned by God. Jesus himself felt this when he cried out to his father while on the cross, asking why he had forsaken him. Pain and loss can cause us to feel not only isolated and caught off from God, but it can cause us to feel isolated and caught off from other people as well. When I was in Belgium, I felt absolutely alone, cut off from everything and everyone that I had ever known or loved. It was extremely hard for me being separated from my children. I desperately wanted to be with them. When I thought about all that I had lost, I couldn't imagine ever being happy again. But I remembered the words of Jesus in John 16, when Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. These words of Jesus gave me hope. He wasn't saying that bad things wouldn't happen. We live in a sinful and broken world, a world where bad things happen. But he was saying that he had overcome the power of those bad things to hold us captive. I tried to focus on other verses that gave me hope. James 1, 2 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Romans 5, 3 says that we are to rejoice in our sufferings. And then 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13 says that we are not to be surprised at the fiery trials that we suffer as though some strange thing were happening to us, but rather we are to rejoice inasmuch as we are able to participate in the sufferings of Christ. From a human perspective, it's simply not realistic to think that one can rejoice in suffering. It's counterintuitive. Jesus taught many things that seem not only counterintuitive, but almost contradictory, at least on the surface. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says that the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. So what do these verses mean? And how does one find joy in suffering? I asked God to open my eyes to the realities that I was not seeing. I remember the day that they brought my three-year-old son into my room. He had been badly injured and had been unconscious for days. He was all bandaged up with bandages around his head and his foot 
and a big metal device screwed into his leg to hold the bone together. He looked like a little wounded angel. When they rolled him into my room and he saw me, his face lit up and he smiled and said, Mommy, when I saw his face and heard his voice, my heart lit up with joy, pure joy. Having my precious little three-year-old son with me did not take away the sorrow of losing my husband, but it was still a gift, a priceless gift. It gave me a glimpse of what it meant to experience joy in the midst of sorrow. To this day, the sound of my son's voice brings joy to my heart. Even though I didn't know anyone in Belgium before arriving there, as Christians, we're members of the family of God, a part of the body of Christ. While I was in the hospital there, the president of the Belgian conference and his wife visited us every single day. Their presence was a gift. Others also visited. I was able to experience the presence and love of Jesus through their kindness toward me. After being in the hospital in Belgium for two weeks, my son and I were transferred to a hospital in South Carolina so that we would be closer to family. Despite the dysfunction in my family, I loved my parents and I knew they loved me. I remember the joy I felt when I first saw them. They met us at the airport and then followed the ambulance to the hospital. I was comforted by their presence. This past year, many of you have lost precious family members. Grieving the death of a loved one is a painful experience, but the Holy Spirit can help keep our eyes open to the good things that are still in our lives. He can also draw us closer, both to our Father in heaven, as well as our loved ones who are still with us. The Bible presents a realistic picture of what our lives are like in a fallen world. It is full of stories of loss and tragedy, but they are also stories of God acting in and through these tragedies. The cross is the central story of God acting in and through tragedy. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke all quote Jesus as saying, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. As a young Christian, I believed that Jesus was asking those who followed him to take up a cross that non-Christians were not asked to take up, or at least a cross that they were unwilling to take up. But the older I got, the more I realized that every child that is born into this world has a cross to bear. Life in our fallen world is difficult. In reality, it is full of suffering, and that suffering is not distributed fairly or equally. I came to understand that Jesus was inviting each of us to willingly embrace the burdens that we face in life. Jesus was inviting me to embrace what had happened in my life. Thousands of people die in car accidents every day. More than a million people are killed in car accidents each year, and another 20 to 50 million are injured or disabled. Unfortunately, what I had experienced is not unique, but is common, a common human experience. We live in a hurting and broken world where bad things happen. Not only was Jesus inviting me to embrace what had happened, he was inviting me to follow him. He has paved the way before us. The cross is not the end of the story. Pain and suffering are not the end of my story. After the cross is the resurrection. This is the gospel, the good news that we have to share with the world. Through my suffering, I came to understand the meaning and the power of the cross in a way that I could not have understood otherwise. Jesus is able to bring light and life to my wounded and broken heart. I likened what I experienced 
the, those weeks and months after my husband's death to seeing the stars in the night sky. During the day, when the sun is out and the sky is beautiful, one cannot see the stars. We may know they're there, but we can't see them. But when the night comes and the darkness settles in, we are able to see the stars. It is normal and healthy for us to grieve the death of our loved ones. At the same time, we can experience joy as we embrace the cross that is before us and we follow Jesus. He has paved the way before us. Isaiah 53, 5 says, For by his stripes we are healed. Solomon Mafosa is a Zimbabwean national and longtime church administrator. He received his Doctor of Ministry from Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan. He has served in numerous positions in the church, but is currently the president of the Southern Africa India Ocean Division. Solomon, welcome. We uh, have a, a question for you, and that is you've experienced a pretty sad loss when you lost your wife uh, some time ago. I know that this was a very difficult experience for you. We've talked about that. What were the biggest questions that you faced at that time? Oh, Larry, that is a, that's a difficult question to ask, but uh, I'll share with you what questions I was asking the Lord. Actually, when I lost my wife, prayer, my prayers changed somewhat those few days after I, I was just asking God why. Why did God allow my wife? Why would he allow such a thing to happen to my wife? Uh, just, just to introduce or to say who my wife was. My wife was an evangelist in her own right. She loved mission and she was very passionate there are many people who are in the church today because my wife worked for them. So she really was with me in the ministry. And when she got sick, she had visited a, a, a non-Adventist church and she was, she was going to go and introduce our literature there because she was also doing part-time literature ministry. She herself was a, an accountant with an MBA, but part-time she would do this uh, literature evangelism. So she made that appointment and then took ill. So I would ask God, but God, why? Doesn't your word say the laborers are few? Don't you tell us to pray for more laborers because the, 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 the fields are white with harvest? It was, you know, and I would just break down and weep before the Lord. So I, I really did not understand why God would allow such a thing to happen. I would look at my own ministry. Honestly, Larry, I've done my best for the Lord. For all the years that I've been in the ministry, I've done my best for the Lord. And so I would ask him, but Father, why? Why at my age? Why at my age? You would understand that uh, the older you are and the more years you have spent with your wife, you, she becomes more than a wife. You, she, she becomes even more than a sister. You just become one. And so those are the questions that I would ask God. But why? But why? So that's, 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 that's what I went through. And the Lord did let me ask those questions. Uh, and I would expect him to, to answer. And each time I would go to the word of God and read, somehow I would find myself gravitating to the book of Daniel and also to, to great controversy, particularly the last chapter, that last paragraph where Ellen White says the great controversy is ended. I loved that chapter. Yeah. It, it really gave me such comfort that one day 
these things will be over. I don't know whether I've said more than you had asked for, Larry. <laughs> oh, I, I remember the time very well, Solomon. It was a, a sad time for all of us, and we felt really for you. Uh, you know, uh, it raises the question, though, how did you find meaning and hope, maybe even joy and suffering? Was that possible? When, when you lose a loved one, uh, how did you find hope? Yeah, you you know that Larry, I I I would talk to the to the idea of hope more than I would talk to the idea of joy. Perhaps mm -hmm. maybe I do not understand what exactly the word joy means. Hope, I found that in Daniel too. That chapter helped me so much. I would look at Daniel 2 and look at all those kingdoms that came and passed as predicted, everything very accurate. The, the, uh, the Babylonian kingdom, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom went past, the Medes and Persians came and went, uh, the Grecian kingdom came and went, the Roman India uh, kingdom came and went, now I would look at the feet and I would say, just as the other kingdoms came and went, surely uh -huh. the kingdom that is represented by the stone that is cut off from a mountain, not with a man's hand, that one is truly coming. And that gave me life. That gave me hope. It also uh, resonated well with the, with the, the book Great Controversy, the last chapter, uh, mm -hmm. when Great Controversy is ended, when Christ has come, uh, the destruction of the wicked, when, when there will be no more death, that, those were the things that gave me hope. The word of God, it came alive, Daniel 2 in particular, and the book Great Controversy. You know, I would read this for the Great Controversy on the second coming of Christ, going to the next chapter that talks about um, the thousand years in heaven and all of that. And then that talks about the coronation of Jesus and particularly that last phrase where Ellen White says, the great controversy is ended. I would long for the time when the great controversy would be ended. And that's what I'm longing for. And that's what keeps me, you know, smiling from the heart because I know as surely as the kingdoms came and went, one day the, the great controversy is going to end and one day there will be a resurrection morning. That's wow. what kept me alive, the hope of the soon coming of Christ. Such a powerful word, that word hope, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Thank you, Solomon. I, <clears throat> I know you live that way too. Solomon, we wish to thank you so much for your time with us. What a blessing that has been. May God continue to bless you in your ministry and in your life. Thank you so much, Larry. I appreciate the ministry and appreciate the time to have been invited to be part of this great program. Thank you so much. May God bless this ministry. Thank you. During the past several months, we have all been faced with some very challenging times. Many have lost a loved one or have seen them suffer from the pandemic. I wanna thank you for joining us today as Dr. Hamill shared her experience of finding joy in her own moments of suffering. As we heard today, loss is not something that goes away, but we are not left without hope. We are not alone. God still has a plan for us. God is with us. It has been said, God gave us memory so that we might have roses in December. Well, in my part of the world, flowers don't normally grow in December. The proverb reminds us that memories can carry us through difficult times. The old saying is true. Grief is the price we pay for love. We should cherish those memories. We have seen that grief is not our enemy, but a reminder of the special moments we've had. Today's webinar was developed by Adventist Possibility Ministries because we know many homes around the world are suffering hurt and pain caused by the loss of a loved one. This raises a number of questions. 
What really is Possibility Ministries? Who are we? What drives us to do what we do? The ministry was developed because so many feel they are alone. Some have lost loved ones, others have been abused, while still others live with a stigma that has left them feeling as though they don't fit in anywhere. This is a ministry of compassion built around the principle of possibility thinking. This is possible because we believe every person was created with a God-given dignity. That understanding changes everything. Out of that, we have developed seven possibility ministries. Bereavement for spousal loss, blind and low vision, caregiver support, deaf and hard of hearing, mental health and wellness, orphans and vulnerable children, and finally, those with physical and mobility challenges. Possibility Ministries is not a program. It is a dynamic movement which is constantly growing and developing. It is a way of thinking and possibly reshaping how you and I see and relate to ourselves and to others. It is a thoughtful way of revealing the love of Christ to those who are often neglected, rejected, or marginalized. We believe we have just begun to see the possibilities God has in store for each of us. It doesn't matter if we can't see, walk, hear. The Bible teaches us that all are gifted, needed, and treasured. That is the reality the world needs to understand. To find out more about how you can be part of this ministry, go to our website, possibilityministries.org. That's possibilityministry.org. Join our network of possibility believers. Whoever you are, wherever you are, let me assure you, you are needed. We need you, and so does our world. Together, you and I can make a difference. Let's begin changing our world one person at a time. Thank you, everyone. We're so glad to have you with us. It's been a very beneficial time for me, even though I've been through the program several times. So we are thankful for this chance of being together with you. We would like to take a few moments uh, just to have a chance to talk with you and to hear more about what you are um, what you think about the program. But let me first of all, introduce our, our panelists again. Uh, they should uh, go ahead and, and uh, allow the video to come on so we can see you in person. Uh, thank you, Dr. Berglund, Torben. Uh, it's very special to have you with us. Uh, your expertise is uh, much appreciated, not only by this group, but by people around the world through your ministry at the General Conference. And uh, Audrey, thank you. Uh, you know, each person shares uh, from their heart, and that means so much. Uh, it is uh, very helpful. And uh, Solomon, are you on here? I don't see you right now. You may have another appointment. But uh, Dr. Hamill, and uh, thank you so much. Uh, every time I hear this, I am blessed. But I, will, I don't want to do all the talking now. I want to give our audience an opportunity to send to me on the chat uh, any questions that you may have for our panelists. Uh, they'll be happy to take a few questions. But let me, while we wait for some questions to come in, I'm just checking to see a lot of affirmations for this. This was, <laughs> this was so good. And I'm so glad that it has reached the hearts of so many people. Uh, Dr. Berglund, um, 
again, as I've heard your presentation, one of the things that uh, stands out, and Dr. Hamill said the same thing, actually Audrey did too, there's something about facing grief and not as an enemy, but as a process of life to recognize that we are in a broken world, but how we relate to it is so important. Am I understanding you correct that uh, grief is something that we shouldn't try to run away from, but that it might be part of who we are, what our life is all about? Well, I, I think absolutely that it's, it's the natural and healthy response to loss. Uh, whether that's loss of a loved one or loss of health or loss of job or whatever it is like we are created with emotions sometimes um, maybe we think sort of we, we shouldn't have all these negative emotions we should just sort of have positive emotions but I think like our brain is designed somehow also to have negative emotions maybe in the garden of eden when the world was perfect there weren't many negative emotions back then but at least the way the brain is now we are have the capacity and we are designed also to feel those emotions and i think they're necessary uh, like uh, physically we have pain sensors in our body we know that that if if that pain sensor system is isn't doesn't work like in leprosy, for example, it people harm, get harmed, they get uh, like destroy body parts because they cannot feel pain. And I see like what we call negative emotions as very much the same just for the mind, that negative emotions, they tell us that something is going on that I need to pay attention to. I can't, I can't just go on with my life as is like the everyday rush and busyness. I need to stop and pay attention to that. And that's why negative emotions are a blessing. Uh, they are necessary uh, to live a healthy, full life in the world as the world is. Um, and we should not sort of just try to sort of dismiss them or run away from them. We need to feel them. We need to acknowledge them. We need to deal with them and, and to respond appropriately uh, to the information, to what these emotions are, are telling us and let them be part of our lives. And grief, which is a complex emotion, uh, you can say it's definitely something that is a necessity if we're going to uh, have a good, like live a real life in this world, the way the world is. Wow. Thank you. Um, help me, uh, Audrey, help me to understand how, while grief is necessary and very important uh, to actually get through the grief, how do we not end with just grief? Is there a transition? Is there something that is beyond, beyond the grief? How do we live beyond that? I'm going to correct you again, Dr. Larry, and say that I don't think you ever really get beyond it. You move forward with it. It is part of your life. And, you know, if you think there's going to be one point where you say, I'm over it, that's never going to happen because you find yourself in a situation and it happens immediately after um, you've suffered a loss. Then you can be surprised by joy because you can have a sense of a memory, something that, that is meaningful. But in the same way, you know, um, four years later, I can still get caught by surprise. And I, I, I remember um, I've talked to a friend who lost their spouse 11 years ago. And, you know, they say, I still get caught out. So, you know, there is, it is something that becomes part of you. It's not that you're always going to be, be sad, but you are going to, you need to accept that this is not something that you just, like an illness, you get over. But you learn to deal and to move forward and to recognize the blessings. Right, thank you very much. And it really isn't a correction, but it is a, 
it is a further ex explanation because I also believe that grief is always with us. You know, I've lost loved ones too. And um, I see their pictures, I'm reminded of those moments. And, uh, and yet, I don't stop there. And I guess that's what I was saying. Now, Anne, we have received some, uh, some very good questions and comments, people sharing their own experience. And let me share one that has come. I lost my dad 20 years ago. And in that month, every year, most recently, seven years, I'm broken. I, I didn't cry. I was a teen. I, I was my father's daughter. He really lived. He really loved me. Is this normal? Yes, it's normal. Um, it's normal. Sometimes grieving the loss of a loved one takes a very long time. And when it happens during childhood or during one's teen years, it's particularly complicated. As a society, we haven't known how really to support children and teenagers in the grieving process. And often they, they just move on without processing it and it continues on and on. Um, I think it's good to, to each year face it as, she, as you are and perhaps uh, meet with someone to help you process that grief. It's normal and it's complicated. Um, but, you know, I think it's a lot like losing a limb. Um, you know, my son lost his toes with appropriate care and treatment. It's healed. He's recovered. But unless one does the, the hard work of grieving in the beginning, really facing the loss, embracing, taking up the cross, the hardship, um, the healing doesn't happen completely and it lingers on for a long, long time. Well, I, just to follow up on that, uh, there was another statement she made after that. She says, should I have been healed by now? What do you think, Anne? Um, under ideal situations, perhaps. But, you know, uh, it's not your fault that you're not. It depends on what, was, what support systems were available to you at the time that it happened. Um, sometimes we, we move on with life too quickly and don't process the emotions. Um, it, take the time that it takes. Allow yourself to really process the grief. And in time, it will heal. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I should mention that uh, Dr. Pastor Mafosa is having internet challenges. He, he um, didn't just leave us, so there are some internet challenges. Um, Dr. Berglund, uh, I, ha I have another question that was raised here. Uh, what practical things can one suffering from panic attacks after the loss of a loved one do to grow out of these attacks? I mean, these are tough questions, I know, <laughs> just like this, but what, what uh, general information can you share? Well, again, I think uh, to consider the panic attacks here as a symptom of, of a deeper issue that needs to be worked on and processed. If this is something that has sort of emerged after the loss then, then I think it's appropriate not only to focus on the panic attacks, uh, but to focus on what are the deeper things? How has this affected uh, my life, my existence? Uh, how do I move forward in life after this? So I, I would say in, in, in a case like this, uh, and, and often I think in, uh, when there is, have been a major loss, then we need someone to talk to and to spend time talking, connecting, processing things, not just trying to do this on our own. Yes, um, yes. Like I've sometimes said, uh, I, I worked a lot with psychotherapy with patients. And I said sometimes, well, if people had really good friends or family they could talk to, the need for professionals like me would have been much less uh, because just the process of talking with someone who is open, listening, interested, not trying to solve all the problems or fix the person, but just allowing the person to talk, to share. And through that, there is a process uh, where you reflect on things, where you process your emotions, 
the present, the past, the future. Uh, and this, so I would, I would say, in a way, of course, panic attacks can be very uncomfortable and it's very unpleasant. Uh, but I would say, look at the bigger picture and, and work on that and, and seek uh, a good friend, family member or a professional you can talk with. I'm, I'm not in any way dismissing the need for professionals. I think that's very good to have professionals. And, and we need that often because sometimes the access to, to people in our private life may be limited uh, on that. And sometimes we need also the professional perspective who can guide us through things and can help us uh, move forward. So I would say, whatever you find that you struggle with after a major loss, if it's anxiety, if it's depression, uh, it could be other health challenges. Like there are many, it can, the grief can manifest itself in many different ways. Um, and then don't just focus on the symptoms, look at more of the deeper issue, what triggered this, what was it that, that is, is behind it, and, and work on that together with someone. Uh, and then, then I think some of these other the symptoms may, may resolve uh, when, when you have dealt with the deeper issues. Thank you. Um, a lot of questions are coming in. Uh... We won't take a whole lot more time, but let me just share another one. And um, Audrey, here is one that I thought was uh, germane to your, some of the issues that you've raised. Over the years, I have stopped being caught up with the emotions of grief over the death of my sister. It does not overwhelm me. I think you can identify with that. You didn't do away with grief. It's still there. You still care for Lars in this case, but you have found that there is something beyond, not beyond, but with uh, that, uh, that aspect. Is that true? Yes. And I think, you know, the thing to um, recognize is that death changes us. We are never the same person again. Right. And um, sometimes that will mean that our relationships with people around us will also change. So some people who maybe have been close to us before, we are no longer close to. And there are new people who we relate to. Um, and I think that is something that we need to be very much aware of that when um, someone dies, yes, they are not there, but it also changes our perspective on life and it changes who we are. Uh, thank you. Uh, here's another question that's just come in uh, from one of our leaders. And it's, um, it's an important one for us as leaders to recognize, and that is this. It says, Larry, I know, it says, do men experience grief differently than women? Anne? You know, I, I, I'm sure they do. Women uh, tend to have um, very emotional experiences, very deep connections, not that men don't, but they process emotions differently. They tend to be more rational in their approach to grief. Um, and I think, yeah, I think they do. I would like to hear what Dr. Uh, <laughs> Torben thinks. <laughs> I'd like to get a male view on this. A male one. view, <laughs> yes. Well, well, I think I think we can uh, safely say yes because I yes. think in general everyone processes grief differently, yes. uh, and and I think within sort of it's this male female distinction can be diff difficult because some women may di process grief like some men would. And some men might process grief like typically women would. Uh, so I think this this is uh, this is very challenging question. It's a very interesting question from from uh, like a neuroscience perspective because uh, it's so difficult to distinguish with between what is physiology, neuroanatomy, what is culture. Uh, in terms of like, what are the expectations that are so deeply ingrained in us from we were children, 
that affect how we process things, what we express, what we hide, uh, what we do. So I think uh, it's, 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 it's a very interesting question. What I think the important thing, the baseline is both men and women grieve. Right. That, 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 that is the important thing. And we must allow space for that and individual differences in how that grief process is for each person. And yeah, I, I like that answer a lot because uh, this weekend, my husband and I have four of our grandchildren with us and we have very different relationships with them. We both love them equally. One is very emotional and affectionate. The other one's more playful. And I think you can apply the same thing to grieving that we relate to people differently and we relate to um, relationships differently. So that I like that answer. Yeah, if, a few years ago, uh, I was honored, I, I considered it honor at least, when my neighbor died, she was a Muslim, mm -hmm. and her family had heard that I was appreciated by that woman, and so they invited me to her funeral. I'd never been to a mu Muslim funeral, and um, they separate the men from the women in the service, and then at the at the burial site, I, it was it was interesting. Um, I was allowed to take some handfuls of dirt and throw it onto the grave. Uh, it was a real honor for a Christian to be invited. I thought, but what was interesting was they would not let the ladies, the women, come close to the gravesite because they didn't think they could handle it. And each culture uh, relates uh, differently, as was brought out. Mm -hmm. Um, let me, um, let me see here. Um, while you're doing that, Larry, can yeah, I just please. underline that there is no, um, every single person will grieve differently. Yes. And, you know, sometimes it's very easy for people to feel, I need to go through these various stages. And if I don't go through these stages, then I'm not grieving properly. And, and that's not necessarily the case. And it's not a linear process. Right. It, grief is messy. Mm -hmm. And I think we just have to accept grief is messy. Mm -hmm. And we can, everyone will experience it differently. There are commonalities. But I think we need to be open to share our experience and to get alongside people and to listen. You know, what you said there resonates with something I heard uh, Torben say, and that is many of us have been trained with a very nice linear viewpoint of how uh, grieving progresses, the stages of dying or whatever. And um, Torben suggested that maybe it's not that neat. Maybe we, move around in, in those steps of grieving from back and forth. Is that, is that, did I understand you correctly, Torben, Dr. Berglund? Yes, yes, and you're welcome to say Torben. <laughs> um, yes, yes, uh, we, when I was in medical school, I was trained in this stages of grief model. And it, it's been, it has value in the sense that it, it tells us that in grief, we have like this denial, we can have this bargaining, we can have anger, this can be all these kind of feelings. What, what is sort of, it's the way it's been maybe it's stuck in many people's thinking is that sort of, it is this process, you, you enter into one stage, you work through that, and then you transition to the next stage. Uh, I assume sort of the theory is not that simple, but that in, in the way we've adopted it and most many people adopted, we, we tend to sort of have this that sort of, well, it's stages and then you come to the end stage and then you move on this kind of thinking that is sort of uh, in, in how we speak about it, it often. Uh, but like, like Audrey says, it's messy. Uh, that's not a bad thing. It's just complicated. It's complex. Uh, there can be this strong mix of all kinds of emotions at the same time. And if you go to a funeral, you can see people crying. You can see people talking, laughing, all these things together and everything is okay. Uh, and, and sort of we, um, like maybe sort of we should more 
see like the grief process that like it's it's sort of everything is on like i hope i don't say something wrong but it's on steroids emotions are like everything comes up every, many things become much more intense even positive emotions can be experienced more intensely uh, so so this allowing for this complex experience intense life experience uh, I think that that is important and not expected to be something that follows a specific process that if you don't, if that's not how you feel, then something is wrong. I think that's very important to understand that that sort of in that sense, there is it's not wrong. There is not a defined time span, which in with you should sort of go through the grief process and then sort of it should be sort of more or less over uh, again. It's very individual. Yes, thank you. And did you, I see your hand on that yes, one. Yes, yes. And I, I just want to add to what Torben is saying that grief is also multifactorial. You know, when you lose an individual, many other things are attached to that. In my case, when I lost my husband, you know, I lost the father of my children. I lost my role as a missionary wife. You know, you, you're not a missionary wife if you don't have, not with a missionary and, and they didn't need me as a missionary, it was him they needed. So I lost my home, I lost my way of life. There were so many factors that were linked in to his death that made it very complicated. And the process of grieving was uh, impacted by each of those losses. So I think right. that's important to remember. Yeah, I, I, I see we now have 27 new messages on here. Uh, we're not going to get to all of them, but there is a relevant one here. And let me tell you why it's relevant. It's regarding COVID. And that's how this whole seminar came about. Mm -hmm. I, I woke up early one morning and uh, because of all the different seven ministries that we have, this particular one for the bereavement of spousal loss was heavy on me that morning. And as I was thinking about it, I, I said, you know, we've got to do something. Uh, there's thousands of people losing someone special in their life. And many of these are spouses. What can we do? Well, so here was one question that came in. How can you live with the fact that your loved one died alone in a COVID ward without <laughs> seeing a family member? I mean, that, that's what... That's what spoke to me that morning when I was laying in bed thinking about this. How would someone, how can we help those kind of people? Who would like to speak to that? And there was silence. <laughs> and, and there's silence because it's such a difficult answer. There's no ready answer. Uh, and it, it's not just those who have died from COVID. All, everybody has been impacted this year. The fact that you cannot visit a loved one in a hospital, regardless of what they have, uh, has made it very, very difficult. The aloneness, uh, people in nursing homes, you can't visit them, uh, is very, very hard. It ha it's hard to live with that. It's hard to accept that. The only thing that m makes it bearable, I would say, is the fact that we're never alone because of the spirit of God. He has promised to never leave us. And we have to hold on to that because the isolation, the aloneness is what's incredibly hard. Yeah, um, there's another point here. Um, let me just read the question. It's a very important one. How, how can you know when a person is not progressing well through grief, but is stuck at one stage? Um, how can we help that person? And we, we are a caring profession as ministers, as, as uh, counselors, uh, and, and, and all of us as members of the church of God. How do we help those people who are stuck in some, some aspect, maybe it be depression or maybe it be anger, uh, avoidance or denial, what, um, how, how can we recognize and how can we help? Any suggestions? There's no easy answer to that uh, question either, but I'll give it a try. I think what's uh, important to re realize is that grieving takes place best in community. 
it's like the, the, the level of support and care that one has after a loss is hugely important uh, in the healing process. And if a person's stuck, um, it may be that they need more support, they need to be heard. And so my recommendation is just be there with them, listen, allow them to process their grief. Don't point out that they're stuck as if they're doing something wrong or there's, it's a problem. I think it's, we need to embrace each other. I think community is so incredibly important. And that's part of this suffering this year is that we've been deprived of community. It's very, very hard. Yeah, this goes, uh, and Audrey, this, uh, this is in reference to you. Um, it says, uh, speaking of another comment someone made, some people put themselves under pressure if they are not over it at a certain time. But it is so individual, mm -hmm. as Audrey has said. And, and if I can just go to something that, that Anne just said now, you know, people very quickly their lives move on you know mm. you 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 have the funeral and then their lives move on yeah but you are left dealing with the loss um you know when my husband died it was an accident and so unexpected with all kinds of ramifications yeah with business and housing and and all kinds of things um and you know it's easy for people on the outside to say well you know why can't they just move on why can't they should be over it by now and i think this is this is the one thing that it isn't necessarily a quick process some things you can get through very quickly you know and and it depends on our 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 background, who we are. Um, you know, I, I, I remember um, talking to someone about six months after my husband died and it wasn't somebody I knew and I started to fill up because suddenly I had to suddenly verbalize the fact to the stranger that my, my husband, who, who I'd been talking about, actually was dead. And they then turned to me and, and said, they had also suffered loss and they said, it's okay to cry. And just that one little sentence yeah. opened a door for me that, you know, and they, they shared their experience and they said, you know, I cried for a year. And, and so I have often shared that with other people. And if, you know, I get into a situation where I get emotional, I just, well, actually it's okay. Mm -hmm. and, and people can look at it and say, you know, really, after so long, you should be over it. No, sometimes you're not. And, and, and I think we sometimes on the outside look and think, OK, somebody should be if they would only do this, that and the other. Everything would be OK in their life. Mm -hmm. But they are not actually walking the journey. Audrey, I, I want to just uh, ask a question. I know the answer to it because you and I have talked about it. But uh, I will ask the question, true or false? When a person has lost a loved one, strangers should always avoid talking about that person. True or false? False. <laughs> you know, it's so important when somebody dies to continue to talk about them and to say their name. Yeah. And just because they are not physically here, it is very, very important and to talk. And oftentimes people will be uncomfortable when you talk about husband, father, sister, whoever it happens to be, but they have been part of your life mm -hmm. and you can't just ignore it. Others have agreed with, the, with you and with me because I also believe that too. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, the questions keep coming. Uh, this has been outstanding for me, and I and based on the comments that we're getting, it, it, it many have benefited from uh, both the professional presentations, but also from the experiential ones that uh, Pastor Solomon 
and Audrey have both uh, shared with us. Uh, one of the comments that has been made throughout the program, how can we possibly get a recording of this program? And we're glad for that. We will be making it available. Uh, it'll probably be on YouTube and or Vimeo. But the best way to find out would be for you to visit our website. Um, and we will be posting it there. Um, and that is uh, www.possibilityministries.org. Possibility, singular, ministries, plural. So possibilityministries.org. You'll find the, uh, the sources there. We also are encouraging Possibility Ministries to be established in every church around the world. This is a caring ministry. The creativity of people around the world is, uh, is amazing to me because they see the principles, they see the need. And as we allow that to be developed, people use their own creativity and it becomes a movement that way. It's not a program that just handed down. We've handed out some ideas, some basic structures. We've got divisions around the world that are putting in place as training programs. We started off with just the deaf and the signing for the deaf and people like in this division, I mean, in, in this group, you have done phenomenal ways from the Spanish to the French to the Kenyan and uh, so forth, all around this whole region of Europe, Africa. That's how we got started with this ministry. I had no idea that God was going to take us any further than that, but it began to grow. Our first meeting with the deaf was in Nairobi with Pastor Paul Moasia, who has been with us today. And then out of that little, little growth, this has expanded into seven different ministries. This is God's doing, and I believe that this is part of revival reformation in the church, because we are opening our hearts to one another and therefore to God's leading. Well, I didn't mean to be advertising, but it's part of who I am now, and uh, it is changing me. The more I spend with this ministry, the more it's changing me, and God is doing a work on me that needed to be done. So we're thankful for that. I want to thank you all for coming. We need to close now. Uh, are, are there any closing comments from our, I don't believe Pastor Mafosa has been able to get back on with us. Uh, any closing comments, uh, Dr. Berglund, any counsel? No, well, there's so many things uh, we could talk about, and I wish we had time to, to answer all the questions. Um, and I was just thinking about uh, one of these last questions, like this being stuck in the stage in, in grief. There, there is something that we, we talk about uh, where we talk about complicated grief or prolonged grief. This is um not about being sort of stuck in a specific stage but but when sort of you're not able to resume life in any way like the death the loss fills up everything uh, and it continues for months for years like that uh, if 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 someone finds himself in that kind of situation i think it's uh usually necessary and appropriate to seek professional help and care for that uh, so we're not talking about that that grief should go away that you process that you're over and done with it uh, but when it becomes all consuming in a way for it's it, try to make definitions on that sort of it is not a diagnosis uh, yet, but, but sort of say six months, 12 months or more, when if that is the case, then like seek, seek professional help support for that. I think that that is, is important. Again, uh, like we need help, we need, we need health care for physical conditions we may experience. Most of us uh, have already needed that. Uh, most of us will do throughout our lifetime. And likewise, with the experiences we have in life, 
uh, our emotional, our mental health and well-being, uh, we may also find ourselves at times where we need professional care and support for that. And I would sort of urge not to uh, just postpone, avoid that, uh, but again, to, to seek that when that is recommended to you uh, or where you sense that this is something I, I need I could benefit from so don't don't delay that uh, and I think for most people in in a grief process make sure you have people to support you and if 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 the people you have in your surroundings your friends family is not sufficient then it's fully appropriate also to seek professional counseling support also in that even even if there's nothing wrong there's nothing pathological with 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 the grief with the process uh but but make sure you have plenty of support uh don't go through things alone that would be my sort of strong strong recommendation uh to to people in that that kind of situation so true and this is the kind of support we're wanting the church to be in fact one of our seven ministries is caregiver support and that is people who take care of people also need to have the support of the church. And so this whole idea of compassion is there. Thank you very much. Dr. Berglund is a, an associate director, as I mentioned earlier, for the uh, Adventist Health Ministries Department of the General Conference. He's a psychiatrist and uh, that ministry uh, we work very closely with. And uh, he's on our uh, committee for mental health and wellness. And so we appreciate his counsel there. Audrey, thank you again. Again, Audrey is the secretary for the Trans-European Division and who has been uh, an inspiration to many of us because of how she has related. Audrey, any closing comments that you have? I'd like to share um, a verse from the Bible. It is one of my go-to texts. It's something that has got me up many mornings when I didn't feel I wanted to get up. And it's found in Lamentations chapter three and verses 22 and 23. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning, great is your faithfulness mm. and no matter what we face god is faithful yeah. and, and i think that's a, a takeaway for this uh, webinar uh, our confidence in god needs to grow stronger but during the grief process it, it goes through a, an interesting transition sometimes and not to be discouraged about that god is big enough stay close to him so thank you, Audrey. And then, um, Anne, closing comments by you. Yes, I would also like to share a text of scripture. It's John 16, 33, and it, Jesus says, in this world, you will have tribulation. He understands that hardship, suffering, loss is a part of the world that we live in. He understands that. But he goes on to say, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And that's the part we can hang on to. He has overcome the power of the bad things in this world to hold us captive. And so as we hold on to his grace, to his goodness, follow him, we will find joy in the midst of our suffering. Amen. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for, for your participation and your sharing as a, as a panel member. I also want to give special thanks to uh, Corrado Kotsi, who has been working with our translators and our interpreters. Interpreters and translators, thank you so much for what you're doing. I also know that you and I who appreciate this program are not aware of all the stress that is involved by the technicians. You and I can involve, appreciate the program. They're helping make it possible. So thank you, everyone. This has truly been a team effort. Mm -hmm. So many people have been involved with, with us getting to this point. We have three different webinars, and each one has a different group of panelists. 
Each group is very good. We want you all to hear the other panelists. Uh, the, the part that Ann does and that I do uh, are all the same, but the panelists are different and they give different insights to some of the same questions. We'll want you to make sure that you have advantage of listening to them as well. That will be made available through our uh, Possibility Ministries website. So thank you. I'd like to close with prayer. Let's, let's bow in prayer. Gracious Lord, for some the Sabbath has ended, for others it's just beginning. But in the midst of all of this, we are reminded that we are created in your image. You have given to each of us, in the midst of our sorrow, a sense of divine dignity. Thank you for giving us hope, because we know that someday we and our loved ones will be restored to the very image that you had in mind from the very beginning. But even now, we sense the value of each person, whether they are able to walk, see, talk, hear, they are also valued. And because of that value, we want to value one another. And Father, that's the reason why we've had this webinar, because we see the value that you have put in everyone. And because of that, we sorrow when they sorrow. We rejoice when they rejoice. So Lord, keep us together. Help us to press together and help us to be supportive of one another in good days and in dark days. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Okay. We would love to hear from you. Uh, write us an email at the Possibility Ministries. I'll pass it on. I've made some notes. I've copied some of the comments that have been made. And uh, we'll post some of those uh, later on, too. God bless you all. Have a wonderful day. You, you're welcome to join us at the Americas uh, website as well. Uh, that comes up in uh, a few hours, but uh, at 8 o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time. But you'll need to register for that one, too. God bless you. Bye-bye.